So pop-up UFO hearings, they just announced last week. So in this video, we'll go through those hearings. What do I expect to happen? Give a basic background on what happened last year. Spoiler alert, it was not amazing. I released a controversial video last week called Narindu Plasma UAP. I asked the community to tell me if it was fake or not, if they could determine they had found some interesting things. So I'll let you know, update on that. And then finally, I talked with Richard Hawk from sky360.org. He has an update on those camera systems. Chris Lado, welcome to Lado Files. Okay, this is the actual bill from the 117th Congress of the United States of America. This is what they look like. So I searched for phenomena is the best thing to search for. There's 57 cases. So let's go to the first one. Tell you here, modification of requirement for office to address unidentified anomalous phenomena. They changed aerial to anomalous in all cases. This is Comptroller General of the United States audits and briefings on the actual UAPs. And then we have the reporting procedures, the actual section 1673. So what does it tell you basically? Authorized reporting. Now they made up a case called authorized reporting. So they want reporting, but it needs to be authorized and kept in classified channels. I have covered this bill in several other videos. You can look back on those for a full read through of the actual bill itself. But I just want to cover what's required of Kirkpatrick, really, and the Arrow Office. Okay, so director and deputy director of the office. That's who will be at the hearing tomorrow. We'll be. Sean Kirkpatrick, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick. Number one, appointment of director. So that's Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick. Appointment of deputy director. Who is that? I actually don't know. <laughs> I'm reporting. It wasn't that easy to find either. So this is actually Sean Kirkpatrick. That's a picture of him. I like the goatee. Reporting in general, the director of the office shall report directly to the deputy secretary of defense and the principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence. So this was an upgrade from 2022, I believe. And now he reports directly to the Deputy Secretary of Defense. So what is Sean Kirkpatrick supposed to do? And who is this guy? This is his bio, actually. So Dr. Kirkpatrick was asked by USDI, I believe that's Moultrie, to stand up and lead Aero in early 2022. Notice Dr. K to his staff and team. He brings over two decades of experience and a significant depth of expertise in scientific and technical intelligence. Space policy, research development, acquisitions, operations, specializing in space, counter space mission areas. So that is interesting. He finished his PhD work in nonlinear and non equilibrium phonon dynamics of rare earth doped fluoride crystals at the University of Georgia. He's currently an adjunct professor at UGA. Again, interesting background. After receiving his PhD in physics in 1995, he subsequently took a postdoctoral position at the University of Illinois, investigating laser-induced molecular vibrations of high explosives under an AFOSR program. That's the Air Force Office of Scientific Research Program. Okay, you can see there, basically, is a career mostly, and the, it was with the Navy. Air Force Research Lab to build ultra fast laser physics labs to investigate nonlinear optics. So he seems like an expert in laser physics. Micro nanofabrication techniques for the Air Force. Excellent. He was offered a program manager position at the NRO and converted to CIA in 2005. So he went to the CIA in 2005. In 07, he was assigned as chief technology officer in a joint CIA DA program office, where he later became division chief as a DIA officer, so Defense Intelligence Agency. In 2010, he was asked to serve as a space control portfolio manager for the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Space and Intelligence. So he does have a lot of space laser experience. I mean, he seems like a good person to run this. In 2012, he returned to DIA, served as the Defense Intelligence Officer for STI, serving as Department of Defense counterpart to the National Intelligence Manor for Science and Technology until 2016. And then from 2016 to his current assignment, Dr. Kirkpatrick served in a variety of no-fail roles, 
don't know what that is, including De Deputy Director of Intelligence, U.S. Strat Command, Director of National Security Strategy, National Security Council, Deputy Director of Intelligence, and the DNI Representative for U.S. Spacecom. Interesting. U.S. Spacecom Intelligence Enterprise was the fifth organization he had be the Intelligence Center lead for establishment. His most recent assignment was as Chief Scientist at DA's Missile and Space Intelligence Center. Okay, interesting. So he has taken over. And he will be the one person that is going to be at this hearing tomorrow answering a bunch of questions. I think he is the right guy to have up there. So what is he supposed to do? This is what this is the login. This is what he's supposed to do. Okay. So Kirkpatrick, as the lead of Aero, all domain anomaly resolution office, he's supposed to develop pre to synchronize and standardize the collection of incidents, including physiological effects. Number two, he's supposed to develop processes and procedures to ensure that these incidences are reported and stored in an appropriate manner. Number three, establish procedures to require the timely and consistent reporting of such incidents, evaluate those links, and evaluate the threat. So is it a foreign government, other foreign governments, non-state actors, and evaluate the threat that such incidents present to the United States? He's also supposed to coordinate with other departments. That's the FAA, NASA. Department of Homeland Security, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, National Science Foundation, and the Department of Energy. Department of Energy, that is a big one right there, I'm sure. And then, as appropriate, and in coordination with the Secretary of State, consult with allies and partners in the United States to better assess the nature and extent of unidentified anomalous phenomena. So that would be a, a question is, have, have they done this? Have they talked to any of our allies? And then finally, preparing reports for Congress, both classified and unclassified form, including under subsection J. So the last report, the first one that was supposed to be due, was supposed to be due at the end of October, October 31st. It wasn't delivered until after 2022. So it was delivered in January 2023, quite late. That was the first report. Hopefully they are on time in the future. So that's what they're supposed to deliver. That's what his actual job is supposed to be. So I would hope they're asking questions on this, you know, have we talked with allies? Have we consulted with allies? Where are the reports? I mean, they did prepare the reports, but like I'll go here to in a second, the report's supposed to have a lot more information in it than it did. So let's look at that. So there is a historical record report due, but that's not due until 540 days after the date of the enactment. So a year and a half. So that shouldn't be until the middle of 2024. And that will include back to 1945, basically the records of documents, oral history interviews, open source interviews. This historical report is kind of a beast, right? So the focus, focus on the period beginning on January 1st, 1945 and ending on the date in which the director of the office completes the activities. Kirkpatrick or whoever's in his position will have a written report detailing the historical record, which includes the records and documents of intelligence intelligence committee, oral history interviews, open source analysis interviews of current and former government officials, classified, unclassified national archives, and such other relevant historical sources as the director of the office considers appropriate. So that is pretty amazing. And that goes back to 1945, include a compilation and anonymization, the key historical record, any program or activity that was protected by restricted access that has not been explicitly and clearly reported to Congress. So is there a any sort of secret government UFO program in the United States. That, that's written right here. That's what they want to know. Successful or unsuccessful efforts to identify and track unidentified anomalous phenomena, so history of it, and then any efforts to obfuscate, manipulate public opinion, hide, or otherwise provide incorrect, unclassified, or classified information, or classified information about unidentified anomalous phenomena or related activities. So, yeah, they covered everything there. Efforts to obfuscate, and there have been efforts to obfuscate by the CIA. Okay, so what are they missing here? Requirement, not later than 100 days after the day of the enactment, fiscal year 2023, and annually thereafter, shall provide a report. So the elements. Should have all these things, okay? So the report was late. It was quite late. And then it didn't have any of this other information. In it. Maybe they have it in the classified report, but I haven't heard that. It would be nice to know from someone that, hey, they covered this in the classified section. So here we have, what are they going to have? An analysis of data relating to unidentified anomalous phenomena collected through geospatial intelligence, signals intelligence, human, human, and 
mess in, mess along with all the other things, right? All reported events. All we got really was the number of reported events. That's pretty much all we got. And we got a basic kind of analysis saying, well, half of these have been determined to be known objects, at least half. This is what they're supposed to have given in the initial report, right? Back on October 31st, identification of potential aerospace or other threats posed by UAP, an assessment of any activity regarding UAPs that can be attributed to adversarial governments, identification of any incidents or patterns regarding UAPs that indicate potential adversarial foreign government may have achieved a breakthrough aerospace capability. An update on the coordination of the United States with allies and partners. Again, we haven't heard nothing on that. An update on any efforts underway on the ability to capture or exploit discovered UAPs. Again, we've heard nothing of that. An assessment of any health related effects for any individuals that have encountered UAPs. And if I remember correctly, they did say that they don't have any record of health effects, which is quite a, kind of interesting because we hear at least rumors that that's not the case. We did get number of reported incidents. That's true. Descriptions thereof. Yeah. Of UAPs associated with military nuclear assets. No, they didn't mention any of that, including strat weapons and nuclear powered ships and submarines. So obviously this will be in the classified report. In consultation with the administrator for nuclear security, the number of reported incidents, descriptions thereof. Okay. So all this stuff on nuclear security, I'm highly <laughs> guessing certain that it'll be in the classified, hopefully in the classified report. The final point on that is authorized reporting. They did go into authorized reporting and it does protect whistleblowers. So the mechanism for authorized reporting. So secretary of defense acting through the head of the office is Dr. Kirkpatrick, Dr. K and in consultation with the director of national intelligence, shall, shall establish a secure mechanism for authorized reporting. Okay. Any event relating to UAPs, has that been done? B. Any activity or program by a department or agency of the federal government or a contractor of such a department or agency relating to UAPs, including with respect to material retrieval, material analysis, reverse engineering, research and development, detection and tracking, development or operational testing, and security protections and enforcement. And remember here, they said any UAP, any event relating to UAPs. So that should be a catch all. And just in case you missed that, they added in here. Okay. So protection of systems, programs, and activity. Obviously, they need to protect the unauthorized disclosure, unauthorized public reporting or compromise of classified military intelligence systems, programs, and related activity, including all categories and levels of special access and compartmented access programs. Yes, they do. So release information without giving away any vulnerabilities. I think it's possible. It'll take a little work, but it can be done. Okay, and this is the interesting part here. Protection for indiv individuals making authorized disclosures. So for everyone making the, uh, the authorized disclosures, you are protected, okay? Authorized disclosures shall not be subject to a non-disclosure agreement entered into by the individual who makes the disclosure. Okay, so non-disclosure agreements do not matter anymore. Number B, unauthorized disclosure shall be deemed to comply with any regulation or order issued under the authority of executive order relating classified national security or chapter 18 and is not a violation of section 7898 of title 18 United States code or other provision of law relating to the disclosure of information. So this is basically freeing up anyone who says I was under an NDA. There's no reason for me to talk. I'm a patriot and I'm not going to give away any information because I said I would not give any information under this NDA unless now they passed the law. That doesn't matter if you're talking to U.S. Congress, if you are filing an authorized disclosure now of UAP, authorized disclosure has all of these protections. So this is the whistleblower protections that we're looking at right here. And to make that even worse, they have prohibition on reprisal. reprisal. So they have protection, okay, of whoever makes such a, such a claim and then procedures, etc. So let's just read it here. Prohibition of, on reprisals. An employee or a department of agency, federal government, or contractor, subcontract, grantee, subgrantee, or personal services contractor of such a department or agency who has authority to take, direct others to take, recommend, or approve any personnel action. <laughs> Gee, okay, does it have to be that? Shall not, or with respect to such authority, take or fail to take or threaten to take or fail to take <laughs> a personnel action, including the revocation or suspension of security clearances or termination of employment with respect to any individual as a reprisal for any authorized disclosure. So I think this is speaking directly what happened to Lou Elizondo. I made a video about that. 
procedures. Secretary of Defense and Director of National Intelligence shall establish procedures for the enforcement. Okay. Hopefully they have done that. Non-disclosure agreements, identification, the Secretary of Defense, Director of National Intelligence, Secretary of Homeland Security, blah, 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 that have supported investigations of the types of events covered by subparagraph A and activities shall conduct comprehensive searches of all records relating to non-disclosure orders relating to the types of events described in subsection A. So basically they want to go back and find all these things. So if you don't say it, they're going to go and look for it is what it, is what it seems like. Okay, so that is basically the law. What that is, is Congress, if you're not familiar, the U.S. Congress actually writes the laws and is the purse string. So they give the money, right? So the money is important. And what you see there is that is the law and they are giving the money with it. So this hearing for tomorrow, what I believe, my understanding is that it's going to focus around the money for Arrow. Why hasn't it been fully funded? So from this article here, this is from Military Times. Congress calls for more funding of Pentagon UFO office by Zimone Perez. Lawmak lawmakers have called to increase funding for the Pentagon's UAP research office following the release of the Biden administration's budget, budget request. So the budget request did not have what they wanted. During a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing on Tuesday, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand questioned senior Pentagon officials, including Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, about the budget request for about the budget request for the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. Questions from Gillibrand, who chairs the Armed Service Subcommittee on Emerging Threats and Capabilities, focused on why the office was underfunded for the second year in a row. This is a good question. Second year in a row, it hasn't been funded. So again, Congress funds these things. They get upset when your programs are not funded. You're not doing what they're asking. That's what, that's what it appears here. Gillibrand said the incidents last month involving the Chinese high altitude balloon and the three unknown objects highlighted the need for us to continue to improve our understanding of UAPs over U.S. airspace. I agree. It, it did. I'm glad they're doing something about it. In response, Austin pledged to fully fund the office in the future and said the Pentagon requested $11 million for its research in the fiscal year 2024 budget. On March 14th, Pentagon spokesperson Susan Goff told Military Times the fiscal year 2024 aero budget figures were classified. Gillibrand has focused on aero funding and coordination since the office inception. Why? Because in 2021, Gillibrand introduced an amendment to the 2022 National Defense Authorization Act to replace the Office of Naval Intelligence's UAP task force with the aero, that is the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. Hard to say. The goal of the restructuring, she says, was to increase intelligence sharing between the Pentagon and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Our national security efforts rely on aerial supremacy, and these phenomena present a challenge to our dominance over the air, Gillibrand said in a statement on December 9, 2021. Staying ahead of UAP sightings is critical to keeping our strategic edge and keeping our nation safe. As part of the amendment text, ODNI, National Intelligence, is required to release an annual public report on UAPs that went through the requirements there. But on February 16, Gillibrand, Senator Marco Rubio wrote a letter signed by 12 other senators to Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks and Deputy Director of National Intelligence Stacey Dixon calling for full funding for the ARO, the office. In the fiscal year 2023 budget, the Biden administration failed to fund anything besides basic operating expenses for ARO, lawmakers argued. They, they just put a placeholder number on it, Rubio told Military Times on Wednesday. Luckily, we're not going to pay attention to the Biden administration's budget numbers. Again, Congress is a separate branch of government. I think they need enough to do their job. If not, don't have it, he added. Gillibrand also questioned Pentagon Comptroller Michael McCord. Comptrollers are like inspector generals, supposed to make sure everything's done correctly. About their budget request for Arrow, McCord said he was not told by the Undersecretary of Defense, Intelligence, and Secretary Robert Moultrie, who has purview over Arrow, that the office needed more funding. So he he was told they didn't need any more money. Arrow is a relatively new office we're standing at, McCord testified. I am under the impression that we have adequate funding for the relatively new office. So it looks like Kirsten Gillibrand is not happy about this answer that they thought they had enough funding. They go to a lot of work to actually fight for those funds, make sure that they are given to the right office. If Arrow is not able to use these funds, you know, that is an actual issue in government. It is hard to spend money sometimes. If you don't spend all the money, it's like Brewster's millions. If you don't spend all the, all the money you get, 
then that means you didn't need it. And so someone else will take it. And so there's always people fighting for the money. And I'm sure like, just like in the past, any investigations for UFOs, UAPs are going to be considered, you know, frivolous by a, probably a large part of the leadership. And they will take that money for what they think is more important, such as weapons or more capability on the battlefield, right? Cause that's what we need. We don't need to worry about what are these things flying around our airspace. We need to make sure we can crush our enemies. By the way, we can already crush our enemies. The Wikipedia page is, is well done, okay? Besides one small note that we'll look at. This is the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office Wikipedia page, quite well done. Let's just go through it. It does have a good background on the arrow if you don't know what it is. On April 12, 2021, the Pentagon confirmed the authenticity of pictures and videos gathered by the task force. That was the UAP task force. These are the three videos, Gimbal, Go Fast and Flare, purportedly showing what appears to be pyramid-shaped objects hovering above U.S. Russell in 2019. On April 12, 2021, the Pentagon confirmed the authenticity of pictures and videos gathered by the task force. That was the UAP task force, purportedly showing what appears to be pyramid-shaped objects hovering above USS Russell in 2019 off the coast of California, with spokeswoman Susan Goff saying, I can confirm the reference photos and videos were taken by Navy personnel. UAP task force included these events in their ongoing examinations. Since then, they've said it's drones, right? Scott Bray's basically said, oh, these are most likely drones. That's what he said in the last hearings that we saw last year in May in 2022. But if you look at actual Navy internal documents, you hear rumors coming about the Navy is, they didn't label it as that. The leaders of the Navy supposedly labeled these things as still unknown. Okay. They, there was no drones or drone capabilities that they could match it to directly. They didn't find a source, et cetera. So last I heard, they don't know. Okay. The Navy was still labeling them unknown. And that was even when Scott Bray stood up and said, these are probably drones. So here are the assessments. This is where a skeptic and science writer, Mick West. So he gets in there and Mick, if he wrote this, all right, has argued that the pyramid image in the video were most likely an airplane, Jupiter, or stars that were distorted when the lens was out of focus. Okay, I've made many videos on this. His argument that it's bouquet does make sense, but bouquet of what? Okay, <laughs> so it's, it, imagine if you see a alien spaceship and it has lights on it, and then it ends up over flaring the actual sensors. It doesn't mean it's not alien spaceship on there. You, you still don't know what it is under there. Okay. And they can't assess that it's drones. Could it be drones? Yeah, it could be drones. But again, why couldn't they identify them as drones? I mean, they shot anti-drone technology at them, they tried to track them down. Also, they were supposedly up there for many, many hours, longer than you can actually have. At least I know about civilian level drones, even military. So. Yeah, I mean, bouquet is a factor, and this is what usually happens is the debunkers come up with some, some assessment, right? This is bouquet, and there could be bouquet there. Same as gimbal. The glare is an issue on gimbal, but it still doesn't hide what is the thing behind it. We still don't know what it is. On June 25th, 2021, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence released a report on UAPs. So this was the first report back in June 25, commonly known as the Pentagon UFO Report. There it is. Amazing preliminary assessment. So. The report found, and this is just go back to the numbers, was able to identify 143 of 144 objects spotted between 04 and 2021. 18 of these featured unusual movement patterns and characteristics, and there was 11 safety of flight incidents. In December 2022, Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, Ronald Moultrie, there he is, said that we have not seen anything that would lead us to believe that any of the objects are of alien origin. So we did say that, and that many of the reported objects may be balloons and things like UAVs that are operated for purposes other than surveillance or intelligence collection. This is likely what happened with these balloon shoot downs, what they say. This is at the Aero office again. So Sean Kirkpatrick, let's see if we get a good picture. No good picture. Ah, oh, the page does not exist. And Kirsten Gillibrand, there she is. Thank you, Kirsten, for your work. This is what Aero will focus on. Surveillance collection, system capabilities design, intelligence operation analysis, mitigation, defeat, governance, science, and technology. Okay, and then for this part, I'll do a summary of the numbers. So what did they actually have? An 11-page unclassified report was released by the office and ODNI, January 12, 2022, prompted by a law that says ODNI must, must submit a report to Congress yearly. 
The report covered 247 new UAP sightings going back to March 2021, as well as 119 events prior to that date that had not been previously examined. Okay, this should say 2023, okay? So an 11-page unclassified report was submitted January 12, 2023. That should say 2023. Prompted by a law that says ODNI must submit a report to Congress yearly. Okay, so they were quite late on that. The report that I just covered what they should have in it covered 247 new UAP sightings going back to March 2021, as well as 119 events prior to that date that had not been previously examined. So 119 new events. The report indicated that there had been 510 UAP reports as of 30 August 2022, which is an increase in the previous number of encounters referred to the office. The report indicated there had been no evidence of aliens. The report noted that out of 366 new reports submitted, after initial analysis, about half were found to have common explanations. Example, unmanned aircraft, balloons, and clutter. Out of the 366, 171 remained uncharacterized. The report noted that some of these uncharacterized UAPs appear to have demonstrated unusual flight characteristics or performance capabilities, and that these reported incidents require further analysis. That's probably the most interesting part of the report that I saw. Okay, and then it gives just a short history. ATIP, you know, Lou Elizondo, started by Harry Reid, et cetera. That was ATIP here. Then you had the UAP Task Force, started 2017. And then Aero, the law has basically said UAP Task Force is done. And now we have the, the office, the office. So what should we expect for tomorrow? The good news is we're having a hearing. So that is amazing, okay? Two weeks ago, we weren't having a hearing. And now we're having a hearing. We're not going to have witnesses. We're not going to have amazing UAP witnesses, but we will have Sean Kirkpatrick up there answering questions, primarily on why this isn't funded, but I hope there's other questions as well. So this is from The Hill. The Hill has covered this quite a bit, actually. National Security, 10 Key Questions for This Week's Historic UFO Hearing. By this author, Mark Renningkampf. So the UAP Office's director will be the sole witness at Wednesday's hearing. As such, lawmakers will likely ask about administrative matters to include ensuring that Aero has the necessary funding to execute its scientific mission. For their part, Republican senators are likely to sharply criticize Biden administration's response to the Chinese balloon shootdown up the U.S. East Coast in February. But federal law requires Aero to analyze UAP since U.S. intelligence analysts tracked the massive Chinese surveillance balloon from launch. It was neither anomalous nor unidentified. The balloon incident, therefore, is not a relevant topic of discussion or a hearing focused on Aero. So it'll be interesting how the hearings actually play out, how much of it will be this political theater. Moreover, Pentagon analysts monitor a small number of Trump era incursions by suspected balloons in real time. But since the objects were officially unidentified, the reports were not disseminated beyond tight circle of intelligence officials, leaving senior policy markers in the dark. Congress established era specifically to address such information sharing gaps. We'll see, right? I mean, when the balloon shootdowns happened, Biden created a whole new task force. They didn't even bother talking to Sean Kirkpatrick, at least uh, as far as I know. So here are some of the questions that Merrick wants to hear anyway. They may consider questions such as this. Of the 500 plus UAP reports, does Aero have high competence? Any UAP exhibited highly advanced technology? I think that's a great, great question. Like they said there already, they've said, yeah, many of them have, some of them. Are the objects in the now famous Gimbal GoFast Flare 1 video still unidentified? If so, what are Aero's working theories for them. And this would be my number one question for the hearings. That's my big question for the hearings is what happened to the evidence at Nimitz, right? The Princeton radar, Kevin Day, Gary Borges say the Princeton radar data was taken essentially by U.S. Air Force people. So people in Air Force insignias, anyway, according to Gary Borges, as well as the E-2 Hawkeye data. Where is the radar data for the E-2 Hawkeye? The Princeton radar is amazing. That thing has amazing, amazing data, and it's super classified, super top secret. There's no way that data is just being passed around out there. It is somewhere. Someone had to sign for that and sign, <laughs> sign the sheet, okay? We track this stuff. That stuff is tracked. So where's the top secret data from the Princeton? And is it being investigated? That is the best case. If they're not talking about the FLIR case where they have the pilots, they have all the radar and they're not investigating the radar data from the Princeton and from the E-2 Hawkeye, then man, I don't know what they're doing up there. So that, that would be my primary question is, what happened to that data? Do you have it? 
does the U.S. DOD, does the U.S. government have the radar tapes for the Princeton and the E-2 Hawkeye? That would be a big question. Are they going to say we lost it? I mean, I don't know. That's my main number one question. Here's the next question I would ask. Has Aero characterized the UAP observed often via multiple sensors by dozens of naval aviators off the East Coast in recent years? If not, what is Aero's working hypothesis for these highly anomalous encounters? Yeah. The next question would be, what's going on on the East Coast? What about the gimbal? What has come up? So the gimbal also had radar data. There's more data on the gimbal. Okay, there's more video. I'm sure there's more video on that, on that video of the gimbal. Has that been analyzed? Are these main events? Those are the main events. Are they being analyzed and tracked? And what have they found? Question. This is a good question. In a striking development, Aero Director Sean Kirkpatrick recently co-authored a scientific paper theorizing that extraterrestrial probes may be drawn to water on Earth's surface. To what extent did recent UAP encounters, the most compelling of which occurred over water, inform this groundbreaking paper? That was interesting. That was a striking development. I covered that as well. That was Avi Loeb's paper on Oumuamua and Interstellar Meteor 2. Check out that video if you want to see Galileo's Pretty impressive expedition to go try and capture that meteor, the second interstellar meteor. And then another good question. The U.S. government has a long history of triumphantly highlighting resolved UAP reports while ignoring, downplaying, or force-fitting scientifically absurd explanations into compelling UAP cases. Recent press reports suggest this may be occurring again. What steps will Arrow take to prevent this? Quite interesting. If you look back at Project Blue Book, I did a video on that as well. They're primarily concerned with just highlighting what has been solved, showing that most of it is solved. And then the rest of those cases, don't worry about those cases. They'll be solved in the future. Like all of these, look, we solved these cases. So obviously the rest of them fully solvable by mundane answers. Okay, so that is the UFO hearings. We'll see what happens. I will be streaming them live on my channel if you want to check that out. Moving on now to the Narindu Plasma UAP. I got a lot of blowback from the community and maybe deservedly so for releasing a video with a single source, right? So I had a compelling interview with Michael. He spent three months conversing over email. He seems like he is legitimate. I have no reason to doubt him or any reason to suspect why he would be lying. He's not gaining any benefit that I can tell. But at the same point, I reached a point. I couldn't go any further in the investigation using my own skills. It's my first investigation into an actual personnel and background checks and keeping their identity, identity anonymous. So at the end of the day, I needed your help. And that, I, that's why I YouTube. I fight like Will Smith does in Men in Black 2, right? I go as far as I can with investigating. And then if I can't get there from here, I'm going to use all your big brains out there. There's a lot of smart people on both sides of the debate, all sides. And I think we do need an open debate to look into the stuff. Could it be faked? Of course. I think it definitely could be faked. And that's what I learned in this is the single source is not the way to go. That we're never going to break through with a single source video, even with a compelling interview. Even if I got all the evidence that you guys say I should have gotten at the beginning, which probably should have gotten right, the metadata built into the into the video. I didn't believe the video would be deleted deleted later on, but I should have got that right away. So metadata is one important thing I realized. And but even with the metadata, that stuff can be fake, right? So all this stuff can be fake. At the end of the day, a single source video is just not going to be provable. I think, even if it's exactly what everyone wants. And that just, you know, forced me to reconsider and just go all in, which I thought was the way anyway, on sky360.org. You know, Sky360, those systems, if we can get multiple captures and use some sort of technology that limits any sort of interaction with the data, if we can keep the data verifiable and from many different sources, I think we have a chance. So that being said, I saw some, some good replications. I talked to Mazyar, he was one guy, VFX 3D professional, and he had just one kind of interesting analysis technique I wanted to show you guys, as well as an update from Richard Hoff's Guide 360. So this is from my discussion yesterday. Yeah, excellent. So I'm here with Mazyar. He wrote me at my email and basically just presented his, his argument as a VFX artist. So Mazyar, if you just explain why you wrote me. So basically, yeah, I mean, I was, I was, again, I'm not a debunker. I'm into UFOs and I have a channel. It's called Point Consciousness. And I've like tried like just presenting stuff that are legit. 
I haven't been active. It's like just a few videos that I've had. But when I saw your video, I was super excited. It's like, oh, wow, this is a legit UFO. And I thought, okay, let me just process it. And I went on and I, I was actually hoping to just put it in my website, in my YouTube channel. And when I did it, I realized, okay, this looks, this looks weird because when I stabilized it, and uh, so basically what I did is that I just uh, did uh, like a super easy, it's like just a channel mixer, like just, you know, whatever that's captured in the black, the black areas you can see, it's just, just amplifying them. And then I'm stabilizing the, the object itself. Right. And I was, yeah, so on the right side is this is the original Norindu, uh, yeah. e video that I released last week. And then what you did is you stabilized it, right? And so you put it here. So it's stabilized against the background. Yep. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So it's just a channel okay. mixer. So it's like just amplifying the black pixels and then stabilizing it. And I was like, just about to just actually, I was like trying to find interesting stuff. I realized, oh, this is like spinning or rotating. It's very interesting. So it's not just a stable, like a stable object. But when I did it and I was about to just like try to find more information, I realized, as you can see the, you know, because when something is pitch black, even with compression and JPEG compression and everything, you can still, like, it still can pick up some pixels and some blocks. So when you look at those uh, surroundings, the object, like the pixels surrounding it, the objects, you see those blocks, there are those artifacts, those are blocks. There are like some information that are captured in the sensor. When you look at those blocks, you see they are moving relative to the motion of the objects to a screen right which means they are stationary. So it's the objects that's move, moving in front of you. It's not, so initially when you look at the video itself, you feel like it's the cats that's moving. It's an, a stationary objects in the air is hovering and you're moving your, like your phone, but it's actually the opposite. It's actually, the camera is locked. Both, Maybe it's probably. pointing, but what, what do you mean both? It can be that the hand is shaking and the object is moving, but both is, happening i mean it could be but i feel like again if you like if you like look at these videos next to each other you'll see that the blocks that are moving you see like the blocks are the motion of the blocks are exactly matching the motion of like the opposite motion of the objects that's yeah. moving in the frame yeah. which again that's what i assume that the, the the camera is stationary and the object is kind of moving and i suppose uh, interview michael is saying that it's it's not like moving erratically, right? It's just stationary and he's like just filming it. He said it was lowering motion. down. So he's hit what he, what he argues is that he's sitting in a camp chair looking straight up and the object is right above him and lowering straight down. So there should be some so, motion, but it should be getting closer to the camera. So, so that's what I thought that cause it's, it, so it's not like moving erratically, right? It's just maybe a little bit of hovering and maybe he's, he's uh, like, oh, he's, phone is moving or whatever like when with the, the the camera is pointing at the the object but uh, but from what i see i feel like it's it's the, the camera is locked maybe it's pointed into the like a windshield or something that's like a 45 degrees or something it's not straight in the like you know a moon roof or whatever it's not it's just a, maybe something like 45 degrees and then it's a reflection i mean this is the first thing that i thought again i haven't uh, like analyze it further. I haven't tried to replicate it, uh, but again, I want to emphasize. I'm not like I'm not tr I'm not like a debunker. I'm not trying to say like okay. I, I'm I'm always like trying to look for like a legit. And I was actually excited when I saw your video. I was like just oh, I want to just uh, put put this analysis in my website and say oh there's a legit uh, like a UFO. But as soon as I saw these blocks, this is the first impression that I have. And I can try to replicate it, but this is the first thing that I thought, okay, this feels to be a reflection of some sort of a something into the wind, like into a piece of like a windshield or something. And that's, that's moving. So it's like the, the camera is locked, but the reflection, that's like a, you're pointing an, something into the windshield or something, and you're just moving it around and you're just filming the reflection basically. Okay. And so you're, you're, and you're able to tell that, right? It's because looking at this stabilized image on the left, you're saying that these background pixels yep. should be moving in different, they would be moving in a different manner if it was the camera itself moving and if the object was descending down, as Michael says. You're, you're arguing that yep. these background pixels should be moving differently. Is that correct? 
yeah exactly the blocks should be following the object basically so what so if 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 the the object itself is kind of hovering and it's not like moving erratically it's just maybe it's a little bit moving so the blocks should be following roughly with the object like roughly but uh, maybe moving a little bit around but not like as crazy as you see it you right now that is kind of matching the other um, the actual motion i i, I hope i explained it well <laughs> Yes, I think I think it makes sense. Yeah, excellent. Well, thanks for your help, Maziar. And I, as I understand, you said maybe you'd help try and replicate it, or you said if you if you get a chance, you're outside. Yeah, yeah, of I, can, a, I can I can try. Life. Yeah, I mean, there's like a I, yeah, I'll try. There's kind of a uh, so I'm living like in a like big city, and it's kind of a light pollution here. But I'll try to see if I can just find a pitch black sky that you there's no light pollution, and be able to just maybe point something into the windshield and try to just film. I mean, I'll do my best to try to replicate it, but uh, yeah, I guess I need some time. And that's excellent. And really, that's the point of why I put this video public. You know, is again, yeah. I I said it's single source, and I th I thought it was a compelling interview. You know, and I and I tend to believe people, so that's why I you know I published it out there. So I'm very happy that you you took the time here and and you found something. It seems like if it's if it's a fake video, we should be able to prove it's fake. Seems I like. agree, and and again, I'm 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 always like again. I was like just I went through all the like the the whole video that you shared. I was intrigued, and I was actually again my default mode would be like people are like telling like they're like telling the truth, and the part yeah. that like the journalist that was interviewing him that was like saying like he was like he's like autistic and i was like just kind of feeling sorry as well it's like just oh my god he's like autistic he doesn't want to be in public and uh, but then again i mean you never know like people's motivations like mm -hmm. and again my default mode would be like okay this guy is telling the truth i i totally get it okay well either way i learned a, that's a cool point right here that you can actually tell that from uh, from analyzing that's at least one little point so yeah if you could keep us up to date i'll release this just as an update video but uh, if you could keep me up to date and let us know if you have any, if you're able to replicate it, that'd be great. Thanks for your help. Yeah, yeah, sure. And yeah, I'll be like, uh, I'll glad, to, uh, what is it? I'll be happy to uh, help you guys out. I would have one question. So from your analysis of that video, why or what is the reason why it changes the color? Is the color change over the whole histogram or is it just in the point light? So the, the change, change of... Right? Yeah, the, the the change of color is uh, it's uh, it, it is a little bit odd. I agree. Like even the the what is it the the lens flare that you see because the lens flare it's usually the shape of the uh, the lens itself, right? I mean the bokeh that you see, like the the flare that you see, it's usually the shape of the iris, basically. It could be like an LED light or maybe something like, like that that has like maybe it's changing in color itself. So it's possible, but at the same time, the Chris, what you shared was right. Like the shutter speed. I mean, if you are in films, we say like shutter angle. Basically, when you kind of like again in shutter speed wise, like uh, if you it's the speed like when it's like just super fast, right? You can see more information. And it's possible that because it, it can happen in the sensor side or it can happen in the source side. So I, I really can't tell because, again, if it's it could be an LED that is changing color. Uh, but at the same time, it could be something's happening in the sensor. But uh, yeah, that's that's regarding the color. But the, the, the shape that you mentioned, Chris, in the email that the shape of the, you know, the L, like those dots, that's also interesting. But I feel like it could be the shape of the source light. I, I, it is actually, it is the shape of the source light, but what the source light is, I don't know. I mean, it could be again, small LEDs. It could be, uh, what is it? I don't know if you can see this, like old, uh, my old phone, like uh, they're, they're like the, in the lenses, you can see different elements or even in the flashlight, right? Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's like a small flashlight or something that has like small LEDs and it's, it's the shape of those basically that, that, that pattern, that matrix. But yeah, I can, I can try to see if I can replicate it. But uh, what you shared about like just uh, the shutter speed and how you can see colors, but your eyes can't see it. Like it's just, you're just being flooded with light and it's just pure white. That's true. That's completely true. And it could be the case here. That's it's it, it was constant. It was always white, but in the camera, it was capturing that because of the shutter speed. But, uh, but it could also be the LED itself, like just that's changing color. I really can't tell, to be honest. Okay. 
Awesome, Mazur. I'll let you go now and uh, keep in All keep right. in touch. Thanks for your time, mate. Yep. No worries. Take All care. Right. Take care. Bye, Mazur. Bye, Mazur. Yeah. Bye. Oh, sorry. I think I just kicked <laughs> you out. There we go. Still there. <laughs> Hello, Richard. How are you doing, mate? Hey, Chris. Yeah, how are you doing? Long Good. time not seen. You're moving, you're flying around this globe. Flying around. Where did I go? You've been in, in a couple of places the last weeks. Yeah, we're well. We're I'm trying to go back to Utah. Actually, Carl, he's trying to set up a trip in June. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, right after the non fungible conference, and then I could set up a Sky Three Hundred and Sixty out there at Mount Wilson. Is a possibility. <laughs> did 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 you talk with Bob about it? No, I haven't. Okay. So you should, because he's very much interested in the same. In okay. Mark Wilson especially. <laughs> well, I wanted to go over, you know, you have you seen the video we were just analyzing there, the, the Narendra UIP? Have you watched, I haven't uh, seen it yet, so it's the first time for me to have seen it. Oh, that is. Okay. Here, let me let me show it to you, and I can get your, your impression. Hold on one second. Hmm. I have to find it. Sorry. And I'm sorry, I had a meeting scheduled at 5, but I don't think it'll take a long time. But we could, we could always... No worries. Meet up I'm here. Again after or later tomorrow or something. Content. We are here in Winterland, so we have to wait anyways. <sighs> All right, I found it. Jeez, it took forever. Okay. So I'll just play it so you know what I'm what I'm kind of uh, talking about here. There we go. Okay, so this is the I called it the Narindu Plasma UAP. Narindu UAP. Hmm. Yeah, so that's the that's the, the video. Uh, it's your how did you get it? How, how did you get it? It was sent to me by email. I get a lot of you know videos by email, and that's by far the the most clear one I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So I basically you know followed up on it. Initially, when I first saw it, it looks like a flashlight or something fake like that, you know. Mm -hmm. But when I tried to, uh, but but the further I looked, then it, it's. You know, the guy, he was very serious. He wanted to maintain his anonymity. Uh, you know, I, I did a back, we did a background check on him. I interviewed him. He did a city, it was a interview. I asked him, you know, are you lying to me? Why are you lying to me? <laughs> okay. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's just a single source. I, I don't see what yeah. he gains out of this, you know, by, by trying to hoax this video. Hmm. But what I really learned is, I can never prove it's correct. You know, I'll never be able to take this video and prove that it's an actual alien craft. You know, the single source video no, no. is just absolutely no. never going to work. No. You know, and I'm trying to like shove it down. You know, you end up trying to shove it down. Like this is an HD video, mm -hmm. but there's so many ways to kind of easily, I think, fake it. I don't know how you get that weird light effect. They're saying I mean, maybe there's multi LED. But my first, my first, so when you, Press pause right now. Can you press yep. pause? Okay. Or a couple of seconds before. Here. A little bit more. Before. I think before. When when we see the, the complete shape. Yeah. Let, let's keep yeah. it there. Okay. Yeah. So my first glance, my first idea was if you take an empty uh, yeah, beer, beer can or Coca-Cola can and you make a pinhole in, in, underneath. And you put the LED source into it, and then in a dark room, you own, the only light source is the LED inside the the empty can, and and yeah, and you film it from underneath. And but I, I still think that it's the camera that's moving. So because it's the camera's moving. When you when you when you see the the directions of how this thing moves, it very much resembles our shoulder elbow movement swinging behavior you know what i mean yeah like it's held yeah i mean it, yeah. what i learned really is that there's there's but literally a million ways to probably different. take this thing yeah <laughs> but there's no way to prove it no. and so it's more like just a learning exercise and then me just getting shot out in public by Twitter trolls, essentially, <laughs> oh, you know, Jesus. because, you know, how could, how could you believe it? I don't know. I mean, he seems very 
sure. <laughs> he says he saw it, then I don't know why he would lie about it, you know. But at the end of the day, even if it was even if it's real, right? Even if it's real and he's not lying and it's just all these kind of coincidences, you know, where we can't get additional corroborating information or you know, the file was deleted. Hmm. You know, kind of these things that, that make it more difficult. What I realized is even if I had all that information, I still couldn't prove that it's real. Even the yeah. metadata, I think I believe can be easily faked. True. So I, I guess I really want to get a Sky 360 update to talk about, you know, <laughs> how can we get a real, you know, what, what do we need to prove it? If we had this video from different angles, you know, then would we be able to uh, give a stronger case? So actually, our, the idea is just that you actually only need one station, that one station can cover the hemisphere and has enough sensors and even a telescope that can it swing to and give you 40 times zoomed in view and recording, auto recording. So that's basically the idea. You do not actually need second or third one just to capture weird things that are not normal, that are not falling into categories like planes, drones, birds, and so forth. But of course, if you can then triangulate and collect the data in a central source, which is the idea, but we're not there yet, then we we'll certainly learn a lot about behavior, how, how, it, how things move, how even, even if it's plasma, whatever, in, in our atmosphere, there's a lot of energy in the atmosphere and a lot of substance that, that plasma can very easily occur. So I think there's a lot to learn on, on all ends. If you had a Sky360 system under this supposed craft, you know, would you be able to, mm. I guess, why would, why would it be stronger? Why would we, we be able to prove that it's, that it's legitimate? So first of all, we would know that the station is stationary, <laughs> implies yeah. in, the, in, the, in the name. So everything that moves is really the moving of something else, but not the, not the camera. Hmm. Yeah, we, we would know the camera. We we, we know all the, the histograms and we, we set mm -hmm. every parameter from shutter to exposure to to cropping, to histograms, all kinds of filters. We, we permanently adjust that so to get the best out of, a, of the current light situation. So we permanently adapt to a current light situation, meaning that what the rest is what, what's still there in the atmosphere and is still moving and, and is giving light off or covering background light, we will still can track it. Whether we learn from that, how, what that exactly is, is another question. So we can certainly know or learn a lot of things. How, for example, if we can find out that this is really a craft because we can see it with several sensors and even with RF, for example, so passive radar, then we can certainly say that's not the plasma and it's something that emits light but is still a body and is somehow reacting with our atmosphere and from how it is reacting with the atmosphere and yeah we can derive a lot of things so how much energy is used for this and and yeah there's a lot of theories around this yeah i wanted to send, show one other one so while i was researching as well came across this Again, from Australia, this I think is, is a large drone, a hexacopter. You know, if you can see here, basically, I just paused it. You have here, I think based on the size and, and distance, uh, that could easily be a drone, a hexacopter drone. You know, if I pause it here, it looks like a triangle. You know, if you can zoom in, it actually looks like a, like a triangle out there. But I guess, how does 360, how is it going to? you know, weed these out. There's simple things that you can do, like say, if, if first of all, you have to detect something, you have to see it in, as a contrast towards the background. And then you track whatever that is, could still be a cloud. Not in this case, because this is emitting light. It is not reflecting light. This is much more light than, than, than there is in the ambient. So it's because the camera would be stationary, you, we can derive very easily the, the kinematic behavior what the curve is that it is flying, how fast it is changing sides or so. We know what drones are capable of. You can even see this in, in these races with drone races. This is incredible what they're doing. But it also 
is a question of time because these drones, and this is a very high flying drone. First of all, you have to keep contact with the remote control. We can cover the RF spectrum and see whether there's someone communicating with this device so that we know that this is a drone that is under control. But of course, there are other drones that are flying their own paths and not remote controlled or not giving anything off. Uh, whether these are ours or not is another question. Mm. And yes, we can learn a lot from the kinematics. And then, of course, how the light changes from the spectrograph. We can say, what kind of... Oh, is this police coming because of this? It, it, it's hard to tell. I believe the drone is further away. I don't know if the police are there, but he, yeah, he says okay, the that's... police show up. He says, he. I think in the video they do talk to him. Yeah, he sends his wife, I think, to go talk to yeah. him. So first, first idea, I also would say they're going to call drone. it in. They said, yeah. So they, they, everybody could see it easily there. That's, I mean, it it feels like a drone to me. I'm just looking at it, it, looks like a drone. Yeah. If it flies like a drone and looks like a drone, yeah, in most it's cases. Hard to <laughs> prove otherwise. <laughs> you have to prove otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, okay. When you have another station, and maybe you, someone can follow this over several, let's say, hundred kilometers. Mm -hmm. then it becomes interesting because normally drones don't fly as so human drones don't fly that far. Yeah, I think it, what I'm, so what I'm hearing is basically your Sky360 systems, they're going to give a really stable platform. That's A, right? So I think we're going to get a stable platform. Very important that we have these several stations all built the same way. So we have the same sensor quality level on all stations. That's very important to have. And then how is it coming? Can we can we build a system now if we're ready to go? We building, we are working permanently on it. Not yet. So we are still pre-alpha, okay? Okay. Still I know, I, I know, I know this this sounds and, and people are upset. I know I know about this. But the thing is, first of all, these are developers who work on that project that give their free time. Okay. This is a volunteer effort. There's no money in play. And we want to keep it that way because money yes. also means influence. So we want to be totally independent what we do and how we think about it. So that <laughs> I'm just giving off, okay? This is not only my personal opinion. It's also the opinion of, of the developer community. Okay. So that's very important from our point of view because we, we, we had the, the, the issues talked about last September, last year, where we actually were about to, to publish the alpha with a different communication internal backbone, you can say. And then there comes Ido. Hi, Ido, if you see this, greetings. And introduced us to ROS2, meaning to turn the station into a robotic system and what the quality of that would be and how that would lead the path to the future and how would that then be if we create that network and, and everything is more or less in real time happening. So this quality of data collection was just uh, overwhelming. That's why we had to postpone the, the, the publishing time for the alpha version. Hmm. And yes, talking with you, I know you're with the UAP Society two years now. You're very busy in, in creating this, this environment for people to, to create that network. Um, I have to tell you, we're very close. What we focus for now is to, to create that backbone. So we need this infrastructure, this basic infrastructure, so that we can put on more and more sensors. So the first thing is that we focus on the fish eye sensor, as all of you know, but also develop the backbone for that. So that in the future, we can just like modules, put more sensors onto it. So this backbone is also needed and that, that consumes a lot of uh, developing effort. Nicola is working hard on, on the uh, image recognition inference, but he's crying for data because we have testing machines out there and we created the training material. That's what he's consuming in, in the training model. So that's a kind of a, a loop where we are right now in. We, we will certainly have something before June. So Excellent. there will certainly be a, an image that we can roll out. And yeah, the, the idea is that, that this one station, we it's, it's uh, by the way, uh, your station anyways, the UAP Society station, the first one. Yes. It, it's uh, at Tommy's place, I think. And he yeah. will build it for you and send it wherever you need it. Perfect. If it's not in Lisbon for the mm -hmm. non-fungible conference, then it'll definitely be in Utah 
at Mal Wilson Ranch. So it'll be okay, one of those. That, that, that would be much easier for Tommy. He could even drive there. Oh, that'd be awesome, actually, to get him yeah. there. That would be amazing. Awesome. Oh, he, well, thank you, Richard. Cool. Yeah, good to hear the updates on that. And yeah, I just I learned from this last exercise on Narindu. I learned a lot on how to investigate, all, like I mentioned, but also just that it, we need we need better systems. You know, we need better data. We need Sky360 out there. And we need this network. We need the, the, the same, the very same sensor spread over the globe. That's what we need. Otherwise right. it's, uh, it's, it's very confusing with so many different machines and quality of data and, and how it is procured and how it is then in custody until you, you get it in your hands. You, you never know what happened with the data in between. So that, that's, that's a very crucial part. So to say, mm -hmm. This custody from this chain of custody from creation of the data with a sensor you know about hmm. up to the point where you can pick it. So there's no inference in between. That's very important to have. But Excellent. by the way, yeah. I, I have to I have to announce one thing if you want. If you yes, allow please. Me to. We re kicked our RF team last week, actually a couple of days ago. And uh, there are now seven developers on the RF team now working with uh, the Kraken hardware. This is a five-channel RF spectrum gathering device. And uh, yeah, the idea is to create a passive radar and spectrum analysis and ADSP in, in one big rollout, probably in the, in the next version. Oh, excellent. Okay, so spectrum analysis of radio frequencies. Yeah, kind of. Oh, yeah. super cool. That would be amazing. You know, special, special yeah. frequencies we can, we can track and so forth. Excellent. Okay, so exciting stuff. We need it, Richard, because I'm out there yes. just getting machine gunned. We all need it. I'm, I'm not a personal investigator. You know, I guess I, I will, you know, take people for their word until yeah. proven otherwise. So e either way, we can't prove that it, that it's real. So we need Sky360. Thanks for being out there. Thanks. Yeah, man. Cool. Thanks. All interesting stuff. I became a YouTuber primarily to learn. I love learning. And you learn much quicker out in the open, getting shot at by Twitter comments. And I think it's the way to go, okay? You guys need to hold me honest. And I think it was compelling. I think the video is compelling. I think it could be faked. And we'll keep moving on, okay? And we're going to focus more on Sky360 and hopefully get the Sky360 launched in early June for UAP Society. Thanks for being here, everybody. This channel is made only possible with your support. You notice I don't tout out any other sponsorships. I don't like trying to convince you guys to buy some product advertising, et cetera. It's not related to UAPs directly on finding out the truth of the phenomenon. So thanks for all your support. If you want to support the channel, hitting like and subscribe always helps to get future notifications. You can also go to patreon.com, get backstage information, backstage access, as well as early access to videos, or support the channel by buying one of the new t-shirts or merch that we have. Thanks again for being here. See you tomorrow at the hearings. Can't wait to see you. I'm expecting disappointment. All right. Take care, everyone. Peace.